I should be broadcasting. All right, perfect. Oh, good. Then everyone probably didn't hear my little spiel right there. Um, <laughs> so today has been fun. Uh, as you might notice from the screen you're looking at, I have no webcam. Uh, I tried to install a new driver yesterday and well, uh, it is not working. It killing my webcam just keeps kicking it off and I didn't have enough time to correct that before this event started. So you will not be able to see my face for this event, which I'm sure you're all just distraught about. Um, Anyone that can hear me, I see Jay can hear me. Everyone else, if you can hear me, please type in the chat bar here. Let's see, make sure everyone uh, can hear and that we're not having any audio issues as well. The video issues are enough for today. We really don't need more than that. Uh, and those that did not participate in the last Medical Nemesis meetup, the basic rundown is, well, I have an hour set aside here. This can go 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour, hour. It really depends on you guys. The more participation, the more questions, the more interaction, the longer I'll stay on here. And that means all of you lovely people in the uh, waiting room and registered for this event, I see a long list here. Feel free to enter the chat room over here leave a message, leave a question, anything on your mind. And there is a delay from the time that I speak to the time that you hear. So if there are questions that arise, or if I ask a question, you try to answer it, there may be a delay. Well, there will be a delay, probably about 15 seconds from the time that I speak it to the time that you hear it. So any sort of delays that might occur, during this presentation, during this event, that <clears throat> is going to be the reason. And is anyone potentially entering this event via phone? If so, I am not sure how that works. I've not tried it on my end. So if you have access to the chat room, let me know. If you don't, I guess you can't let me know. So I'll just have to figure that one out uh, at a future event. All right, a couple minutes here, getting started, still getting set up. It is unfortunate that the webcams are not working. I'll try to have them set up and working properly by the next one. The next event will be on the 20th, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it is the 20th. So what we're going to do during these is just go over different topics that people have posted on the medical anemonist mastermind uh, questions that i receive through tutoring sessions any kind of topic that is in our book read this before medical school anything that's discussed on our show the medical anemonist podcast feel free to bring up those topics dealing with mnemonics with study skills prioritization anything like that it's really intended to be more interactive. If I'm just sitting up here lecturing the whole time, it's kind of boring. That's passive learning. That's not active learning, which anyone that's a fan of the show knows we preach against all the time. You have to be active in your learning. So be active in this event. <clears throat> hmm. Maybe I could create a poll. Well, I'll wait for that. So, Jay, where do you come from? Where do you reign from? Where do you reside? I like to get a general idea of where the students and learners are coming from for the show for the group seemed to have people from all over the world. Actually, when I was looking at those that registered for this event beforehand at a lot of us, Canada, I think some in Australia, uh, possibly some in India, people from all over the world. <clears throat> I 
All right, I'm not getting any questions yet. So let's see, what are some topics here? <clears throat> oh, fair warning, I do apologize early if we have any uh, trains, planes, automobiles that go by, you will hear them. I don't have a great way to mute them out while well, I could mute the microphone, but then we're just sitting here listening to nothing. So might as well just let them go by. Uh, the last medical anemonist meetup we had, which you can find the archive on our website at freemeded.org slash meetup or on the freemeded um, YouTube page or trying to post the videos. I'm not sure if I should even post this as a video afterwards because we don't have any video to work with, but Maybe we'll figure something else out to do with it. Um, but yeah, the last one, we went over a lot of topics involving even the pre-study period, sort of how to pre-prepare for your studies, how to get everything in your study environment, in your learning environment, ready for an efficient study session, getting rid of distractions, making sure that yourself and your desk and everything are set up in like an ergonomic setting that really helps to reduce strain on your body, which means you can sit there for longer and study without aches and pains developing and come back for more sessions. We covered some other topics involving prioritization of materials. Um, let's see, techniques like the Pomodoro technique, where <clears throat> you can take scheduled breaks and they help to relieve the cognitive loads. You can ultimately study for a longer period of time in total, but taking more breaks in between. So those can all be found on the last one. If there are any particular questions revolving or involving any of those techniques, feel free to write them in the chat box and I will be happy to try to answer them. Uh, we also covered things involving the Covey management grid. I really like that grid. Stephen Covey made the management grid for seven habits of highly effective people. And it's one of my favorite prioritization tools, tried dozens of different ways to keep to do lists and prioritize all of my materials from my home tasks, from my study tasks, from everything else that we need to complete in a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, to be as efficient as possible, you really need to pick an order to everything. You need to make sure that you're getting the first, the most important things done first. So that's a great tool to do that. We cover a lot of those in the in past podcast episodes as well as the book. Um, but any questions revolving, involving those, I don't know why I keep saying revolving today. I think I'm already flustered from the whole webcam fiasco not working earlier. So it's going to be an interesting day. So what are some new topics we can cover then? So let's see, I have a list here. Oh, here's an interesting topic. The production effect. I really like this one. It's sort of innately understood without being fully explained most of the time. The production effect is basically when you speak aloud, when you rehearse your study material, anything that you've just learned aloud. And for many students, this is really uncomfortable. We don't like to necessarily speak the material out loud. We don't want to be caught if we're saying it incorrectly. So uh, in those situations, you can always talk to a dog or your pet or your kid maybe, or a wall. It doesn't really matter. But for some topics, and this might not be universal, but some topics, there is research showing that the production effect or speaking the topic aloud can actually increase your long-term retention of it compared to just going over it silently in your head or trying to write it down or something to that effect. So that is an, an interesting little sort of study tool that you can add to your tool chest at this point. We've covered so many in the past, but that one, I don't think we've really gone into great detail about, and I'm not, ex I'm not an expert on the material uh, as far as which research shows which, but uh, there does seem to be some conflicting information, as there is with most study materials, as to when it's the most useful, but there are enough studies out there to demonstrate benefit 
from rehearsing material out loud, from speaking it out loud. I look at it in the same way as when you're writing your own study notes versus just reading someone else's or reading out of a textbook. You're using multiple parts of your brain. You're not only recalling the information, you're having to synthesize it in your own words and then the kinesthetic aspect of writing it down, activating different parts of the brains, therefore wiring different neurons together. And as you've probably heard before, neurons that fire together or wire together. Ah, yeah, it's going to be one of those days today. <laughs> Oh boy. So by speaking it out loud, it's kind of like writing or, or writing the material out. And this is where different neurons, different parts of the brain, your, your speech portions of your brain compared to your motory and sensor, uh, sensory aspects of the brain can then possibly make some connections and have some interactions that might be reactivated later on when you're trying to recall that particular information, that particular study topic. So something that I like to do sometimes anyway, it is kind of a, a weird practice to get into is just to rehearse what I just read out loud. And it does sound weird to some students because you might just figure I can rehearse in my head real quick. It'll be quicker than speaking out loud. Anyway, I'll be fine. But it really is a self check when you speak out loud, when you read the material out loud or don't read it just rehearse it from memory no priming close your eyes don't look at any notes and rehearse as much of the information as you can as if you were explaining it to someone that's never heard the material before and if you get that right then explain it to a peer whether that be another pre-med or medical student or if you're higher in your education at this point maybe a resident or even higher and if you can keep explaining at these different levels, starting off at a very basic level, good. Move on to the next higher level, good. The higher the level you are able to rehearse the information without being primed, the deeper your level of knowledge in that subject might be. And this is a great way to find out if you have deep knowledge on maybe tumors of the bone or maybe skin disorders or the physiology of certain blood vessels when they interact with certain uh, in certain pharmacology, for instance, whatever the topic might be. And obviously there are millions of different combinations of topics that we have to learn about and use in conjunction with each other in medicine. You can discover how deep your knowledge might actually be and help to prevent that illusion of knowledge, that illusion of competence. It's a form of self-check, which is always useful. Ugh, next topic. <clears throat> Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to add them into the chat box. Love some questions. More interaction. The more I get to stray away from just reading from a list of bullet points, which is not that interesting for me. I'd much rather get your direct questions, your direct experiences, see what you need help with, and see if there's some ways that we might be able to help you out, either myself or others participating in this event. So here's another aspect I want to cover then involving the sort of, again, with the self-assessment and self-monitoring, sort of this metacognition of your study sessions that we talk about in a few past episodes. There's a great episode with Dr. Jared Cooney Horvath on the medical anemonist back in, I want to say around episode 28, plus or minus a few, and our recent seven-part recap which uh, really it takes all the highlights from all of the past episodes from 2019 and condenses them, takes just the best clips of each episode. That's a great way to find out what has been discussed on the past dozens and dozens of episodes without having to actually listen to each one of them if you're on a time crunch. Of course, if you want more information, you can go back and check the episode that the clip was taken from. And all that information is in the show notes for each episode. So there's always some easy ways to find out more, to dig deeper if you find something interesting. But this metacognitive process that we try to bring up is very difficult to explain and probably why most of us either never heard of it before, or, or at least it was never explained in a, a way that was um, practical, that we could actually use to our own benefit. And one of those that I think is worth discussing 
is how do you feel when you get something wrong, when you get a question wrong on a quiz or a practice exam, or maybe you were called on in class and your brain froze, you couldn't think of what to do. What's going through your mind at that point in time and, and how do you feel? And if you don't have a good answer for this, that's perfectly understandable. Most of us don't have a good answer for this because the way our brains react to getting something wrong is it's a negative stimulus. It causes basically the same response in our brain as if we were just stabbed or injured to some degree. It causes a pain response or a threat response. It goes by several different names depending on who's discussing it. And our brains don't want to focus on pain, on things that are uncomfortable and emotionally um, traumatic. So it tries to sweep that under the rug really quick. So the point of this is when you get something wrong on a quiz or an assignment or in class or on the on the wards in, you know, doing your clinical rounds, whatever it might be, try to become a little bit more aware of when that happens. Be aware of the feeling you get at that point in time. Do you feel crummy? Probably. Is your brain saying, all right, get past this, move to something else? Most likely. Is that what you should do? Probably not. Because in that point, when you're feeling lousy, when you know that you just got something wrong, your brain is also very primed, as Jared mentioned in the episode. It's primed for learning. It's primed to find a way to solve this problem. It doesn't know what the problem is. It just knows, I don't like this feeling. I don't want it to happen again. So the two options are sweep it under the rug, ignore it, move on, and not progress, or to learn, to take that opportunity to make the correction needed so that that doesn't happen again. And the way he explains it is um, much more eloquent than myself, obviously, he's the expert, but in that point in time, when your brain is really primed for learning, if you have something in place, something prepared to feed it at that point in time, some method, some process, not necessarily material, although material is going to be a part of the process, then you can advance your knowledge much quicker. So what do I mean by this? Well, another topic that was discussed by um, Dr. Daniel Sadawi Kanafka, also around that period of time in the podcast number, I think he was 29, 30, something like that. I believe it was before episode 31. And he discusses WHOOP, which is Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, Plan. And I think these two topics and several others that were discussed in previous episodes are very similar in their mechanics. And they actually kind of go together in some ways. So the priming aspect that was mentioned by Jared can also lead into what to do next. And that's where the planning aspect from Whoop can feed in there and uh, make sure that you're not just stumbling for the next step. In an instance like this, what I mean is know that you're going to get things wrong. You might not know all of the ways you're going to make a mistake, but have some in uh, some plan for, whether that be getting a question wrong in class. Okay, let's use that as an example. What am I going to do when I get a question wrong in class? Am I going to then slouch, slouch down in my seat and try to hide as many of us want to do after getting something wrong? Or am I going to say, oh, shoot, I thought I knew that, but I didn't know it as well as I should have. Let me add that to my flashcard deck or my notes or something so I can review it more frequently than I thought I had to. Or Maybe I didn't know that at all. So what am I going to do when I don't really know something at all? If it's the first time I've heard it, well, I need to add it into some sort of space repetition, some sort of study session for the future. So when you already have these plans in place, then when the obstacle arises, which in this example is getting the question wrong in class, you already know what to do. You are primed in that state and you have a plan set and you're going to be much more efficient through your studies for well, for the rest of your life, not just for medical school, but for everything. <clears throat> Take another moment here. Any questions? 
I don't know how many people are actually able to hear me at the moment. So besides Jay, I'm not getting too many responses, unfortunately. Um, but that's fine. Hopefully <clears throat> some of you might be on your phones or might not be able to enter the chat room. If you do want to ask some questions, you can use the same link, hop on your computer. I think it works best in Chrome as far as the desktop browsers go, Safari for iOS, <clears throat> and I'm not really sure for the others, but there are still some browser issues depending on what operating system you are using for uh, this, this software hop-in that we're using today. Let's see, what else can we do? Um, okay, I do love talking about deliberate practice. So anyone that has not read the book Peak, I strongly recommend it by K. Anders Ericsson. Uh, it is the science, something in the science of expertise. I don't know the whole subtitle. I probably should remember that for how many times I mentioned peak, but I usually just say peak and Dr. Anders Ericsson and everyone knows what I'm talking about. Uh, those that have read the book anyway, or heard any podcast that he's been interviewed on or heard of the 10,000 hour rule, which was based on though slightly incorrectly on Dr. Erickson's work. So his work is studying experts and how they became experts. The work was then quoted um, by Malcolm Gladwell to make the 10,000 hour rule. But basically what he demonstrated in his research is that anyone can become an expert. All of his research, there is absolutely nothing to point towards anyone having a natural ability towards one thing or another. It's kind of the same principle as grit from Angela Duckworth. It's that the effort put in to something is going to depend on the returns you get, not your natural abilities or inabilities. And Dr. Anders Ericsson's work also pointed out kind of a step-by-step -step process for this. And it's not just the quantity of time, which is why the 10,000 hour rule doesn't really work. You can spend 10,000 hours twiddling your thumbs. You're not going to be a, a master, um, what's it called? War? Thumb wars. Yes, thumb wars. Not going to become a master at thumb wars. You would have to actually practice playing thumb wars with other people. And you would have to practice with different levels of people with different skills. And you would have to see why you are losing for those games that you lose and actively try to better yourself so that you don't lose uh, the same way you did previously. A terrible metaphor, but point is the same. You can become an expert on any material with the right sequence of events and with the right plan and with the right um, support. So there are two different terms that he really discusses, and that's purposeful practice and deliberate practice. And I'll explain the differences here. The, but let's start with purposeful practice. And that's basically when someone is trying to learn something with a lot of effort. So for most of us, that would likely be our medical studies. Uh, there might be some courses, certain disciplines that are easier than others that we might have background in, or we're just better at those subjects and put less effort into them. But some we're going to struggle with. No one's going to get through every class and not struggle. So think of the effort that you have to put into certain studies. And then think of how well, or maybe unwell, that you plan for those. Do you actively plan out every month, week, day, even hour of your schedule and what you're going to tackle and when, what materials you're going to cover? What... Um, and, and what kind of end goals do you want to reach with that plan? This is why we talk about SMART goals sometimes. It's not just having a general plan, but like, how are you going to reach it? How are you going to measure that you're improving? How are you going to know when you reach that goal? And what time frame are you going to set those goals for? So part of purposeful practice is having a goal and having a very specific goal and then putting in the necessary effort to get there. But on top of that, sometimes there are just going to be areas that we are going to be limited in. Maybe we don't have past experiences 
in those topics. So they, they're not intuitive to us, or we had maybe not the best professors in a prerequisite to that course. So we're already starting off with cards missing out of our deck. We have a higher uh, magnitude of difference that we need to get to than maybe some of our peers. And sometimes it's just not really feasible, at least in the amount of time that we'd like, to reach those goals on our own. And that's where deliberate purpose or deliberate practice is different than purposeful practice. This is where you pull in an expert, a mentor, a coach, someone that has been through the process before, that knows what you're going through, and that you can talk to about where you want to go, why, and how you're going to get there. And then they can point out potential pitfalls that you might not see, or question if your end goal is really where you want to be, or if maybe that's just a uh, like a surrogate marker. It's not the end goal. It's just kind of a benchmark that you might be going in the right direction, but it could be misleading. This is where an expert could help a lot in making sure you reach your next level, whatever that might be for you. So with this purposeful practice, deliberate practice, you also need to really make sure that you're focusing more time on your weak points. You need to notice what you're getting wrong, but also why you're getting them wrong. And that's the hardest part. Because if you do a lot of question banks or something along those lines, it'll tell you what your answer is and what the correct answer is. So you'll know which answers or which questions you're getting wrong, but you won't necessarily know why. Is it a knowledge gap? Is it a test taking gap? Is it something else? Um, and that's part of the med edge method that we discuss in our book too. And some of those topics are discussed in past episodes as well. I think we cover it a little bit in the recent recap episode. There's also a four part mini series for read this before medical school. So each part of the podcast kind of goes into a section of the book and explains it a little bit better. Uh, those that would like a free PDF of that material <clears throat> can go to freemeded.org slash medstudent. And we do have a free PDF, like Essentials of Workbook, that you can download there. So when you're focusing on these goals and you have, and you're putting in necessary effort, obviously, like we were saying, you can twiddle your thumbs for 10,000 hours. That's not effortful practice. That's not trying to do better than your last production. I think in my interview with Anders Ericsson, actually, he made the comparison that, um, or maybe Malcolm Gladwell mentioned it and he brought either way. It was saying that the Beatles were so good because they played over 10,000 hours in all these, you know, clubs and nights, uh, nightclubs and stuff for many years. And Anders Ericsson said, well, no, that's not right. Because if you're playing the same song, for instance, over and over, you're not trying to better yourself. You're just doing the repetitive motion. You're doing something you're already good at. You already knew the song before you performed it the first time, most likely to provide effort, to move beyond your comfort zone, to try new things. That is where the effortful practice comes in. And that can be very difficult to um, realize and schedule on your own when you're a student. You might not know how to get out of your comfort zone or might be afraid to because you're on such a deadline constantly. There's always looming deadlines for this next quiz, this next assignment, how much material you have to cover this day or this week. So finding a mentor or someone that might be able to help guide you through that is that extra step, that extra path that is usually needed for expertise in a subject. Do you need to be an expert in everything that you cover in med school? No. Do you even need to be an expert in one of those disciplines? Probably not. But you should probably learn to be an expert in learning. That is one thing that you will need to do for the rest of your academic career. That is one thing you will need to do now in pre-med, in med school, in residency, and after continuing education. And even more so as the world evolves and becomes more advanced technologically, more interconnected and global, the amount of new information that you're going to have to decipher and retain within a period of time, within a month, within a year, is not going to decrease after school. In fact, for some, it might increase. So learning how to learn, becoming an expert learner is probably the most beneficial skill you can possibly teach yourself. And here's our first train. 
Well, with the current video issues that we're having and without too much participation here, without any questions, I feel like that's probably a good place to stop today. I don't want to drag these on too long unless there's a lot of interaction going on. Then I'm fine to stay on as long as you guys want. But if there are no questions, then I think I'm going to call it a day. And the next event will be on the 20th. So mark that down on your calendar. You can also see all the past archives and uh, future plan dates on freemeded.org slash meetups. And we try to post them on social media, but who knows who sees what with all the different funky algorithms that Facebook and such have. So the best way is probably to go to freemeded.org and join the... Yes, Jay, go ahead. Um, and to join the newsletter. Uh, again, with the delay, I'm not sure when you're going to hear me. But yeah, if you have some questions, please enter them in the chat. Hopefully everyone can find the newsletter now. I didn't realize that with some of the website changes we've done recently that it's kind of hard to to find that uh, the old link. I have recommended your podcast to all my students and most of them think very highly of you and your approach. Oh, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Uh, have them come on too um, on the 20th. Get the whole group together and have a nice discussion. <laughs> I would love to hear what people are actually thinking. It's surprising how few people actually respond to podcasts traditionally. I know people with thousands of subscribers that rarely, if ever, get a comment uh, from any of their audience. So they don't know if they're doing good, if they're doing bad, what their audience likes, what their audience doesn't like. And I feel sort of similar to that in, in some ways. I know I'm not as good as some of these people only have a couple hundred and they have, you know, dozens of people. Uh, Mabel can't hear anything. That's unfortunate. Um, hmm. But yeah, um, some people are just much better at getting the the interaction between their audience, getting that, um, what's it called? Building a tribe, I suppose. <laughs> Your interview selection is commendable. Thank you. Yes, I have been extremely lucky with some of the interview guests I've had on both the academic and psychology side and the mnemonics and memory champion side. Um, I don't know how so many of them have said yes. It's very rare that someone says no. I've had a couple of um, more famous or really famous people in the in that category, I guess, that have said no. But what's your recommendation for introducing this at high school? Um, so it depends on what you're talking about specifically, because uh, learning how to learn, as you mentioned earlier, is kind of a wide breadth of material. Um, I do think that high school is probably a particular challenge. I'm not sure what country you're in or if your high school students might be a little different. Um, high school in the U.S. is quite variable. You have some really knowledgeable go-getter students and then others that are very much less so and would rather be anywhere else than sitting in the classroom. So you will have to base a lot of what you teach them on their level of um, reciprocity of the material. Are they going to be interested in it? Or is there a way that you can make it interesting for them? So New York City Public School, gotcha. Um, maybe I should have some of my high school friends come on and discuss that a little bit. I am less familiar with the population and I try to block out most of my high school days at this point. But I would say assess their interest in several different techniques. Some might take to one technique more than another. Try to give examples that are relative to them personally, not just the material they might be taking in class that may or may not be personal to them, might not be interesting. 
memory palaces are tricky to teach at first, especially, um, I mean, even for people that have been doing them a long time, sometimes it's hard to teach others about it just because there are so many personal aspects of creating a memory palace. Um, you can, for those that want to learn more, use the free course from the magnetic memory method. Uh, you can definitely search it. Or if you find my past interview with Anthony Mativier, which was, I believe, episode eight and nine, I do have links in the show notes of those episodes for his free course. And also if anyone does pay for the, uh, the other courses, I do get a, a little cut uh, affiliate commission for that. So, but you can just check out magnetic memory method and um, take his free course for the students that want to <clears throat> learn a little more about the memory palace. And it's great to get an introduction via a course like that. But then uh, the issue I ran into when I first started was I got stuck really quick and I didn't have anywhere to turn. So that's where maybe some online um, forums with people with similar interests, maybe the Medical Nemesis Mastermind group on Facebook would be a good place. They could come and ask questions. I do try to answer all the questions on there. Anki is, of course, a great software for space repetition, which a uh, good thing about space repetition is you don't need to teach it like you do with visual mnemonics and memory palaces. I have obviously had some success with space repetition software like Anki, but I've also found that it doesn't work for me in certain aspects as well, uh, especially when it comes to arbitrary categorizations, charts, tables, things like that. Uh, creating a visual is broadcast. Did I get cut off? I'm not sure. I got cut off. Now it says live. Oh, I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure if it's my computer, the internet, or the software. It seemed to kick me out there for a minute. So I'm not sure if you heard all of that. I hope you did. Um, if you have any other questions, though, feel free to reach out, especially on the Facebook group. I love to have more interactions on the Medical Nemesis Mastermind. And you can join there if you're a student, if you're a teacher, ask away. Hopefully other people will jump in too. But if nothing else, I got gotcha. you. Um, it was unfortunate that Mabel wasn't able to hear anything. I'm not sure why that error might have been. I'm hosting a pretty large event coming up in about a month and a half, a little over, called the Online Medical Education Summit, and I'm using this software for it as the current plan is, so I really hope not to have these issues. I think the webcam issue is almost certainly on my end with the driver update, but I hope it doesn't kick out uh, people as we're broadcasting as it seemed to have just done to me. All right, then if that is all the questions for now, I think I think that's about it. Yep, any other questions? Feel free. Oh, there's another one. Um, a little bit strange, but I really hope that you can guide me. English is not my first language. Memorizing mnemonics is only at times possible. What is the best way for foreigners to approach mnemonics? Ooh, good question. Okay, so <clears throat> I would, I, I'm not going to be able to give you specific examples, obviously, with the language differences, because a lot of the mnemonics creation is going to be based on your language and your past memories and your past experiences. I'm currently actually working with a gentleman from India that uh, I think his group is called Ed Through Story, so Education Through Stories but T-H-R-U, not sure if that was supposed to be funny or um, memorable that way. Anyway, so we've actually been going back and forth and he's using certain cultural references and, and differences that he finds more memorable. And I'm kind of switching them over to make a more Western culture um, relatable topic. So I guess what I would say is, First off, what are you using the material for? Actually, it doesn't really matter what you're learning the material for because it can be used for anything. And you can use your native language or you can use English. You can use any language you want because your mnemonics are yours. Unless you're trying to teach them to other people, then obviously it would make more sense to teach them in whatever language they speak in. But actually, I think being bilingual or multilingual gives you a huge benefit because you have more potential 
wordplay that you can use. You can use words from your native language or your uh, secondary or learned languages. So the best way for a foreigner to approach mnemonics, I, I don't see a difference in how you would approach it. You would still want to use things that are personal to you. You would want to use things that are potentially more memorable, whether that be graphic or sexually explicit or violent or anything that has an emotional tone, maybe extremely happy or extremely sad. Anything that is different from the norm, different from mundane, that strikes the brain is going to be more memorable. If you make a boring scene, it's no different than if you're watching paint dry. Your brain doesn't find it interesting. It's not going to want to remember it. But you have a lot more options, I believe, as being multilingual on how you can relate different words to different images. Uh, I'm not multilingual. So again, I can't think of any examples right now. Um, let's see. I know some have been discussed in past episodes. There's one with Brad Zupp. He was learning another language and he gave some examples there. Um, there's another one. I think with Jonathan Levy, one I've seen in a lot of his materials is Kabar, Kaber, which is a Spanish word, which I don't actually remember what it looks like or what that means because I was not learning the language. I just know he's used it as an example. So he uses a visual of a bear inside of a car and that reminds him of, actually, let me look that up because it might make more sense if I knew what that was. Um, not that I know how to spell it properly. About a Spanish translation. Yeah, translate it means to fit. Okay, so that's why the bear is fitting inside the car. Anyway, strange example, but... Other words, modify the ones already available. Okay, so you want to modify them. I would, well, my recommendation in that case would be don't make your own. Anytime you're using someone else's, they're not personal to you. And by the uh, by design, they have to be kind of mundane because they're usually being used for the purpose of sale which means you can't make things very graphic and explicit because you want everyone to be able to use them and not be offended by them. And that can really harm the, um, the strength of that representation of that association to you. So I would, yeah, I would recommend that you just don't uh, use those really. And I don't think there is a useful way in converting them when if you're going to go through the effort and the mental process anyway, why not just make your own? You know, those are going to be personal to you. You're welcome. I'm, I know that wasn't the best help. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, if you're going to go through the effort, you're going to go through the mental strain, make your own, they're going to be better. And that's where the skill developing is really useful anyway. It's not just about remembering this one thing using someone else's mnemonics. If you can develop the skill of creating mnemonics faster, and stronger, then that's worth it on its own. You're really teaching yourself the material, but you're also teaching yourself the skill of mnemonics training. So that would be my, my thought on that. I'm glad to get a couple of questions there. Thank you guys. Um, if there are any more before I end, please let me know. If not, the next session will be available on freemeded.org slash meetup. Tell your friends, tell your classes, bring whoever. And yeah, the more conversations on these and you know, on the, the Medical and Eminence Mastermind on, group on Facebook, the better. You know, when you guys ask me questions, I really like it. It makes me think about it too. It makes me question what I know and try to find a way to explain it to someone else. And this helps me build my skill that I can also help pass on to all of you. So the more interaction, the better. All right. Looks like that will be it for today. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me and I hope to see you in the next one on April 20th.